Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks to the organisers for inviting me to give a talk this afternoon. Um, I'm Emily Adams from the Research Centre of Drugs and Diagnostics, hosted by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about diagnostics for elimination zones of visceral leishmaniasis. And this is really based on some modelling work that I've been privileged to do with uh, Warwick University, specifically Graham Medley and Deirdre Hollingsworth. And this is kind of very hot off the press modelling work for, for visceral leishmaniasis. So this is our uh, institute in Liverpool. Uh, and first of all, I just wanted to uh, briefly go over some of the, um, the diagnostic work that we're doing, just to show really that Liverpool are working on uh, a diagnostic pipeline from discovery to implementation, uh, kind of across disease areas, HIV, TB, malaria, NTDs, and then more working on emerging infectious disease. Um, so we're talking about dengue, chikungunya um, technologies at, at lunchtime. So focusing in on the NTDs today, uh, and then specifically visceral leishmaniasis or calorazar. So we have elimination targets for, for uh, VL. The target is to eliminate as a public health problem in the Indian subcontinent, so less than one in 10,000 uh, infections. Um, currently, Nepal is doing rather well. They've reached their elimination target for two consecutive years. Bangladesh, in the last week or so, have declared themselves uh, under that elimination target as well. And uh, India has rather a way to go. Our current diagnostics are a little bit similar, uh, and I think some similar messages from my talk and Philippe's, um, are antibody tests, so the RK39 uh, rapid diagnostic test, which was one of the basis of running the elimination campaign. So it has a very high sensitivity in suspect populations and around 90% um, specificity. Problem with this test is that in the general population, the, um, the number of positives is also quite high because a lot of people have been exposed or have prior infection of, of VL. The direct agglutination test, this test uh, down here produced by ITM and KIT, um, also showing high sensitivity uh, and higher specificity. We have our parasitological techniques, which are highly invasive, so splenic aspirates, which are pretty much never done anymore, except in uh, clinical um, trial situations. We have uh, parasitology of bone marrow. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, our antigen tests, of which KTEX is the only commercially available test, with variable sensitivity and challenges in utility, because you have to boil urine but with a rather high specificity, although not so many studies performed on KTEX. And then the PCR, where we have, again, high sensitivity, a rather low specificity, as you can see here, but that's probably due to a lot of um, true positive patients being uh, falsely diagnosed as, as false positives because of our poor reference standard. So these are the um, current diagnostics available, and as you can see, uh, variable sensitivity, specificities, and utility. So we were given the challenge, and we we're working with the Diagnostic Modeling Consortium that Azra Ghani presented earlier this morning, of looking at potential uh, target product profiles for visceral leishmaniasis, looking at some of the first attempts to model uh, transmission of VL, uh, and see how diagnostics really fit in, in transmission. So we know that um, transmission is primarily caused by um, uh, proximity to an index case uh, and, and, and VL clusters in villages around index cases. So these highly symptomatic people are the drivers of transmission. Um, but we also don't really know anything about the relative role of asymptomatics and these PKDL patients. And we don't know their, their role over time. Um, but it is assumed that they are infectious to sandflies at some level, but at a lesser extent to, um, to clinical uh, VL cases. And I would love to present to you some of the data that Azra has, but unfortunately the VL community, we're a little bit behind that. We don't have any xenodiagnostic work. We haven't really even done any um, uh, membrane feeding, and, and so uh, we know relatively less. What we do know about is health-seeking behaviour, and these are the delays in health-seeking behaviour in the three different countries in ISC. So Bangladesh at the top with a total um, delay from seeking help to diagnosis and treatment of around 54 days. 
In Nepal, slightly less. They spend longer um, with, uh, with fever, with uh, non-specific symptoms before they go to seek help. Uh, and it's a little bit shorter from when they seek help to when they are diagnosed. So a total of 55 days. And in Bihar, you can see that this is much longer. So they seek help very quickly, but it takes 90 days to be diagnosed and treated. And that's probably because they present with non-specific symptoms and they enter, a lot, most people enter the private healthcare system uh, and they are kind of taken down different diagnostic algorithms until they eventually are diagnosed with KA. And a lot of this, um, this kind of delays in healthcare seeking can actually um, explain the differences in uh, transmission levels in these countries at the moment. Um, you can see here, this is just a, uh, where people go from fever um, to fever healthcare seeking and then to Kalarazar healthcare seeking. In Nepal, they, they kind of go from fever to Kalarazar before they seek help. And in India and Bangladesh, they, they rather take this route. So there's a big impact on transmission in this long delay in, in diagnosis in Bihar. So we move on to a transmission model where we uh, add in our susceptible and latent uh, classes of patients, the fever, the people who seek health care with fever, the people with KA, and the people who seek help with KA, uh, and a, an adornment phase, and, and um, PKDL would, would come off this. So what we wanted to do was um, model the impact of switching the um, long delay of more than 90 days before you receive treatment in, um, in India to the, the model that we have in <coughs> Nepal. So we changed, we switched the diagnostic delay in Bihar to 10 days to match that of Nepal, which includes um, a, a plus two weeks fever. Um, and see what the incident, the, what the effect of, on, on incidence is. So you can see um, when you start this implementation program at, at, uh, at one year, you get this huge peak in cases because you detect so many more people um, because you've reduced the, the time delay in diagnosis. Uh, you then see very few patients. You, you're under that elimination target. And if you take away your, your intervention at some point, then you will see... Uh, a, a rise in cases again. And that rise um, may end up in an instance that is actually higher than, than that we have now. So although this would be clearly an extremely good strategy, it, it's maybe not totally sustainable in the long term with, without other interventions such as vector control. Um, we then wanted to model, so we've, we've um, reduced the diagnostic delay to 10 days, but what would happen if we reduced that even further and actually started diagnosing KA patients before they became full-blown transmitting patients uh, in, in, the, um, in the environment? So can we actually diagnose people before that, 40, that, that clinical suspect that we have at the moment, which is 14 days fever with a palpable spleen? Um, and so currently this is not possible due to the low specificity of the antibody tests and the high invasiveness of the parasitological techniques. So I'm, I'm not suggesting we do this right away, but what would happen? Um, and so you can see again that you would have um, a spike in cases because you'd be diagnosing people much earlier. Um, and if you took away that intervention, you would first of all get a peak in cases because more people um, are... Uh, are um, able to get VL because of reduced immunity, uh, and then you'd get, you'd get another spike in cases um, when you took away your intervention. This is with a diagnostic that's actually only 30% sensitive, which we would consider extremely low. Um, and so you can see, even with a test of moderate sensitivity, you would actually see a large effect on transmission dynamics for KA. But I hope you are sitting there going, well, that's all fine, but what about specificity? <coughs> Currently, as we know, and the same for trypanosomiasis, there's no way that we can administer the, the current drugs for, for VL um, to, to patients who are, are febrile, who have an RK39 um, positive test because of the lack of specificity of this test. So at what specificity might we be able to start treating patients earlier? And actually, it's extremely high. And you can see here the relationship between specificity, sensitivity, and the proportion of false and true positive cases that you would detect. 
So, uh, and, and th there's also this kind of amplified problem that Philippe illustrated earlier with, uh, as you move towards elimination, your positive predictive value of your test will decrease, thereby creating more false positives. So in fact, your specificity of a test, if we wanted to use it pre-two weeks fever, would it have to be exceptionally high and, and, and more than 95%, 98%, sorry. Um, so the, these are kind of it, a, a wish list, if you like. So were we able to rather focus on specificity of tests for VL with the thought of diagnosing earlier uh, and move away from our current focus, which is on sensitivity only? So what tests are in the pipeline? Do we have any more specific tools that we might be able to use for, for visceral leishmaniasis? Um, so uh, you heard earlier from Joseph um, the development of, of a lamp test for visceral leishmaniasis. Um, this is a, another molecular test, and we've seen earlier that the specificity of that test might be low, but that actually might be because they're true positive patients. And in fact, none of these tests have been um, uh, tested it in that in that population, but that's one certainly one test we can think of. LAMP isn't um, a test that you could perform outside the laboratory at the moment, and so are there other molecular tests that you might be able to move from a laboratory setting into a community setting that might have a higher specificity? So here uh, we're working with a company called uh, Epistem, who have produced the Gene Drive, which is this small portable. Um, handheld uh, PCR device, and we're working with them on diagnostics for tuberculosis, chikungunya, and dengue, but might they think about uh, visceral leishmaniasis? And then, uh, then the antigen test. Now, we saw earlier that the KTEX test actually has a very high specificity, but a moderate sensitivity. So might that actually be a test that is appropriate for early, diagnos early diagnosis of visceral leishmaniasis? <coughs> And currently, there are a couple of other antigen tests that are in, uh, well, redevelopment and, and um, a new development from FIND and IDRI. So might antigen testing sh give us that high specificity and moderate sensitivity to enable us to find patients at a much earlier time point than we car currently can? So I'd like to thank uh, the modelers on this project, which, are, as I mentioned earlier, Graham Medley, who's just moved to the London School, and Deirdre Hollingsworth from uh, University of Warwick, and Pierre Oliaro from uh, WHO TDR. Uh, this uh, study was sponsored by the Diagnostics Modeling Consortium via the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Azra also mentioned earlier the formation of the NTD Modeling Consortia, which will enable us to take a lot of these questions forward and really look at target product profiles um, maybe do some of the work in the field, uh, looking at the diagnostic studies, which there are uh, multiple groups now um, forming these uh, sandfly colonies to really establish who is involved in transmission. So uh, we look forward to working with the NTD Modelling Consortium, headed by Deirdre Hollingsworth, uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much.